year. And as Kathleen Morris, who heads the Washington State Anti-Trafficking Response Network, once put it, you know, we think of trafficking as this huge network of organized crime, which it is, it can be, but it can also be just that couple that want a nanny and don't want to pay for it. So uh, it is that kind of a widespread of an issue. Uh, and of course, the numbers within our own borders, the number of children involved in commercial sex trafficking is anywhere from 100 to 300,000. And uh, the evidence suggests that children under the age of 18 now constitute the largest group of trafficking victims in the United States. The, uh, the, rather than talk about Utah, because frankly we have a long way to go in our work on human trafficking, but uh, the Attorneys General, I want to talk more about what we have been doing uh, as Attorneys General. In every case, I'm going to represent to you, both individually and as a National Association of Attorneys General, in every single case, there has been direct and close collaboration with federal, other state, and local authorities. And, and so this isn't just Attorney General out there, it is working with, with everybody. Recognizing this problem, uh, Rob McKenna, the Attorney General of the State of Washington, uh, who is currently the President of our National Association of Attorney General, used as his presidential initiative, which each one of us has if we serve as President of NAC, is this issue. And he, he got very aggressive, very organized. He got all the other regions. There are four geographic regions within the National Association. We currently are here within this, the Conference of Western Attorneys General, but each region as well took on his initiative for the first time. And, we, and he called it Pillars of Hope, Attorneys General United Against Human Trafficking. And the four pillars uh, representing uh, the pillars of justice. And by the way, uh, I did bring a copy of my book here. I wanted to back up a little showing the pillars of justice. This is a commercial advertisement. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, is the, is the reason why I bring up the book and why this topic is so dear to my heart is it took me seven years to research the life story of Dred Scott, who was that slave who so wanted to be free that he sued for his freedom in the state of Missouri uh, and on for 11 years and would not stop fighting until he got all the way to the United States Supreme Court, resulting in what is known as the worst decision in the history of the Supreme Court, the Dred Scott case. Uh, and, uh, and while we studied it in law school as a constitutional issue, a separation of powers, if you will, between uh, federal uh, federal government and the Supreme Court, which is kind of, again, risen to the surface apparently last week as to the power of the Supreme Court to overturn a major act of Congress. Uh, but that was the issue that you study in law school. But I want to know the, the, the story. I mean, really, uh, we, we sometimes in our job as a profession, we're so into numbers and into programs and to check off lists and to how we, you know, these things we're trying to get done. But sometimes many of us at this high level, maybe not the ground level where you're working directly with these victims, but sometimes up to certain levels, we lose the human touch. And, and I wanted to know, for some reason, who Fred Scott was and why, what his story was. And so I spent seven years uh, in between uh, conferences. If I had a conference in, in Virginia of Attorney General, I'd take another two days and drive down to Southern Virginia where Fred Scott was born. And I started writing his book and his story about his life. About 150 pages into it, I, uh, I stopped writing. But you know, who am I? to tell a story about a slave. How can I possibly relate? People today, particularly African Americans, might say, who are you to write our story? I mean, that's, you know, you're a white Mormon guy from Utah. What do you know about slavery? And believe me, I've been asked that question many times <laughs> as I've uh, been around the state. In fact, I was in Tennessee, uh, recently was meeting with some pastors from Koji, the Church of God in Christ. The first thing they said was, Mormon from Utah, why did you write this book? Uh, and what I, what I had a problem with is, not regardless of my race or my religion or where I'm from, trying to understand how do, you, how do you tell a story today about and put people in a position of what it was like to be a slave. What must that have been like to not have your freedom? How do you, how do you, how do you relate to that? I, as a, a father and a husband, I tried to relate to this experience that Dred Scott had uh, and the title of the book, Am I Not a Man? To be not treated as a man, be treated as, a, as an animal. And what that meant when he came to his family. And the one story that, that really stuck with me and that really came to life with me, to, to kind of put you in the mood, if, you're, if you aren't at that level of working with these victims, about what it might be like to be in slavery, unable to control your destiny in your daily life, it was a moment when, uh, one time during this litigation, Things were on hold, and Dred Scott was being, and his family. And by the way, he's, he finally sued uh, when his uh, his oldest daughter, who was born on a Mississippi steamboat, 
her name was Lizzie, but he called her Gypsy because that was the name of the steamboat. When she reached the age of 12, 13, when in the, in the parlance of the day, she was likely to be taken away from his, her parents, put up on a stand, probably stripped naked, probed by white men, and sold into slavery and, and degradation and rape, and never to see her again. And the inability of a daddy to stop that from happening. Even more poignant was a moment when Fred Scott with his wife and two little girls were walking along the country road and along came the master that had, he'd been suing. And everything, the courts had put everything on hold during the appeal process, but the master was so upset that he, finding himself alone with them, forced them into a barn, made Fred and his wife stripped naked in front of their two little girls, and took out a horse whip, began to whip Harriet Scott. Now you men in this audience see another man strip your wife naked in front of your children, pick up a whip and begin to beat her. What man here would not do everything in his power to stop that? I think we all would. What woman would not fight back in this group if they saw what was happening to their children? And yet in this case, Dred Scott knowing that if he intervened, if he did anything to that white man to stop him from doing what he was doing to his wife, he would destroy everything. Just a couple of weeks prior to this, a, a black man had struck a white man, simply hit him, he was tied down and burned slowly to death. And, and, and Dredd knew that if I intervene, if I do something, if I'm a man, like any man would do, I will be killed, my wife and children will be sold away to sleep. The inability to stop an injustice in front of you is what slavery is about. The inability to do something about it, to have no control. Now bring that to the day, because slavery's over, right? We, we did away with it. Actually, Dred Scott led to Abraham Lincoln's election, Emancipation Proclamation, Civil War, 13th and 14th Amendments. And it was a great thing. Slavery exists today, and we need to think about these victims, whether they are the domestics or the children or others involved in the international sex trade and what their lives are like. And so uh, these four pillars, we think of pillars of justice, pillars of hope, are number one, making the case. We're here today educating not just you, but the, but the, the local populations where we go. Holding traffickers accountable, increased laws, tools, to uh, and, and, and resources, frankly, to be able to put into proper prosecution, conviction, incarceration of traffickers. Third pillar is, is helping the victims, and fourth is reducing the demand in the first place. Again, it's about education and prevention, interventions, programs. Uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all. De we, we designed it as attorneys general, and particularly Rob McKenna, attorney general of Washington, as a toolkit that other AGs across the nation can kind of take and use uh, in, in whatever they, way they want. It, uh, collectively, the, the program is designed to prepare a sound assessment. We're looking forward to all the information that's going to come out of this conference. That'll be put right into our uh, pillar of making the case and, and preparing ourselves to do a better job. We uh, encourage we're encouraging all the states to participate in the FBI's efforts to map and track the data uh, across this country uh, to help support the launch of their new business and training plan to fight human trafficking. Uh, we are involved in analyzing existing state laws and simple statutes and sharing that across the country. What is working in what states, what new laws are passed. We certainly saw what Washington did in the recent legislative session. We want to do the same here, and hopefully they'll do that across the country as far as the tougher laws to, to assist those, to add to the federal laws and, and the efforts to collaboratively respond. We want to identify state and local service providers, networks, and the grassroots advocacy groups. They're out there. They've been working for many years, often ahead of government in responding to this problem. We can learn so much from you uh, in raising community awareness, creating new partnerships between law enforcement and the service providers. And uh, promoting a zero tolerance, frankly, for trafficking, reducing demand and identifying victims through a, a widespread public awareness campaign. It takes money to do that. Combining resources allows us the ability to better do that. Um, let me just tell you what so far has been happening in the years since we launched the Pillars of Hope nationally at our annual conference. Uh, the National Association, we passed unanimously a resolution in support of it. 
Uh, let me just tell you what some of the states have done already. Uh, the Attorney General of Florida, Pam Bondi, uh, was able to get new state legislation passed to make Florida a zero tolerance state for human trafficking. Mississippi Attorney General Jim Hood has been working to erase public awareness throughout his state, plans to strengthen laws that deal with human trafficking crimes. Harry King from New Mexico, uh, he uh, was recently featured on, featured on America's Most Wanted for the prosecution of a local human trafficking case. Uh, J.B. Van Hollen, the Attorney General from Wisconsin, uh, again brought uh, forward and pushed new legislation. And uh, the Department of Justice has just published a human trafficking guide for criminal justice professionals. Greg <coughs> Zeller, who's the Attorney General of Indiana, knowing from uh, the experience in Texas a year ago about uh, what the Super Bowl did as far as bringing in uh, men who wanted sex with children in an organized effort to provide that, knowing that it was the uh, the Super Bowl. Uh, he, he, he formed a program, Greg Zeller, he called it Don't Buy the Lie, uh, it, to respond to this uh, creatively in Indiana prior to this recent, most recent Super Bowl. Martha Coakley, our friend from Massachusetts, the Attorney General up there, uh, was recently acknowledged by Shared Hope International for the great work in passing new tough statutes. And uh, I guess I understand four individuals from, from Martha, I saw her a week ago have already been charged under that new law in Boston. Uh, there, there are many other things going on, but the, the time is short. Let me just say uh, what, we're, what we're also emphasizing. Uh, we really appreciate Polaris' leadership uh, in getting out there with the, uh, with the hotline. We are working hard to increase awareness and use of the hotline, 888-373-7888. And uh, it's been receiving an average of about 65 calls a day. That means about 2,000 calls a month. In 2011, uh, they took in 19,427 calls. That was a 64% increase in calls from the prior year from 2010, which means people are learning, the word is getting out, there's a place to go, there's hope where you can find it with, a, with that hotline number. Call volumes are definitely increasing. We think it's the direct result of publicizing that, that hotline number and, and ask our media across the country to continue to advertise that number. I guess Polaris has been operating that hotline for now for about four years, and uh, they've received over 47,000 calls during that four-year period. And they know that about 5,500 victims of human trafficking have been helped uh, or learned about those, those specific victims through the hotline, and, uh, and so it continues. In conclusion, let me just say, obviously, there's a lot of work to be done. We admit that here in Utah. We really appreciate it. This is a huge kickstart for us to have you here today. And uh, we look forward to a year between now and the next legislative session where we're going to get a lot done in the state, and we know that will happen nationally. Uh, for those who tweet, which I do, uh, we, uh, we encourage people to, kind of, to use hashtags like uh, Human Trafficking Summit. Have we got a hashtag for this one yet? We will before we finish this morning meeting, because all three of them as we sit here. Uh, but uh, this is particularly important because of our youth in particular who use Twitter and, and other social media to get word out. And so it's important that, that, that those in particular who may know of victims caught up in this, children involved in this problem, uh, may find out. We, uh, we, of course, as Attorney General, were able to enter into agreement with Craigslist, where they, they agreed with us to eliminate, cut down the number of, uh, of uh, petitions on their adult website. Uh, Backpage is one, backpage.com is one we're still working very hard. We ask people to, uh, Sign an online petition uh, to demand back page, shut down their adult section. We know specifically that, uh, you can tell, and we know specifically that there are multiple, multiple, multiple offers there of child uh, sex trafficking. We, uh, so far, back page has resisted our efforts as Attorney General. Uh, we're up to the fight. We recently got the five largest banks in the world to come to the bargaining table and come up with billions of dollars. We believe that ultimately, groundswell of public support will, t will ultimately convince Backpage that it's not worth the uh, $22 million that they're making off of these ads. And we'll get them to shut that down. Uh, with that, once again, I uh, really appreciate the fact that you are here, the invitation to participate in the Evolve. I look forward to a great conference and learning from all of you. And uh, I know, ultimately, that at the end of the day, when you think about uh, what it might have, must have been for a man to be treated as not a man, but put yourself in the position of a child, who already feels weak and unable to protect themselves, 
in a, in a situation where there is absolutely no hope. You bring them hope. We're going to hear from the victim in just a moment. That's what it's all about. We really appreciate you being here uh, and the fact that you're there as people who will step up and protect these little ones who cannot protect themselves.